All right, guys, good morning. Welcome. The team, guys in the lobby, grab your coffee, donut, come on in. Let's get going. As you see from the uh, slide, Merry Christmas to everybody. This is the last team before our Christmas break. Uh, we do not meet next Friday morning. We will reconvene on Friday, January the 4th. So we got one week off, then we'll kick it back off again. Let me just give a little bit of a, a short explanation for a very long story. Uh, last week, as you know, we had to cancel due to a facilities sort of emergency that happened. It is a long story. It involved uh, fire extinguishers being set off in this room that were unauthorized by a group that we were serving by offering our space, and this, that dust gets everywhere. But James uh, Chavez and our facility staff worked tirelessly to get the, it ready for the weekend. They just couldn't get it ready for Friday morning. And then we talked about maybe trying to move to South Street campus for that one morning, but we're already down a couple of facilities, staff members, so it was going to put a lot of stress on them. So we decided let's just take one week off, get started again this week, and we'll, we'll carry on. So that was the story. We appreciate James, and some of you guys actually helped too over the weekend, so thanks a lot for that. And, um, but we will be off next week. We'll be on for the weekend after that, or the Friday of uh, January 4th. Now, if you're, um, those of you who are part of Chapel Street know we have... Um, a big weekend coming up with, with our Christmas services over that weekend. They're all, we had traditionally had Christmas Eve services that are uh, a big deal. A lot of people home for, uh, people who were home for break, family in town. We have a, a, a huge turnout on Christmas Eve. But this year with Christmas Eve on a Monday, we've put all our weekend services beginning on Saturday are all the same. They're all celebration of, of Christmas. So we have 12 services over our three campuses. So if you are looking for a place to bring your family and or extended family to just have an hour of worship and celebration over that weekend, we have 12 of them. And there's, a, there's one that'll fit your needs beginning on Friday evening at 5 p.m. at our Mill Creek campus, which is down on Main Street in Batavia, about a mile and a half or so west of Randall Road. Uh, then at this campus on Sunday morning, 9.15 and 10.45 at our South Street campus, 10 a.m., one service on Sunday morning, Mill Creek, one service Sunday morning. On Monday, they're all over the place. Three services here, one, three, and five, three services at South Street, two, four, and six, and two services at Mill Creek. So with all that said, if you're looking for a place, go to our church website, chapelstreetchurch.com. You can find a service that fits your family. Hopefully, you'll see you there. Um, if you're interested in where I'm going to be speaking on Christmas Eve, that Monday, I'm speaking here in this room at 5 p.m. service and at the 6 p.m. at South Street. Uh, Pastor Jeff is doing the other services here. Pastor Sterling's doing the services at Sterling Moore at um, Mill Creek. So hopefully we'll see you and your family over Christmas Eve. Here's our story for today. I don't think I need to apologize ahead of time, but maybe. Uh, after, after retiring from football as a Hall of Fame quarterback and living a long life of making bad TV commercials, Aaron Rodgers dies. <laughs> hey, I'm just getting started. Aaron Rodgers dies and God somewhat reluctantly welcomes him at the gates of heaven and starts to show him around. They come to a modest little house with a faded green Packer flag in the window. God says, congratulations, Aaron. This house is yours for all eternity. Now, you need to know this is special because not everyone gets a house all to themselves up here. Aaron was very appreciative and felt very special indeed until he happened to notice another house, a much larger house just down the Golden Street. Now, you know this isn't really the way it works, but for the sake of the joke. Um, it was an enormous three-story mansion with a blue and orange sidewalk, doors and a roof. It had a 50-foot flagpole in the front yard flying a huge Bears logo flag. And every window had a blue helmet with a C on it. Aaron looked at God and said, I'm not meaning to be ungrateful at all, Lord, but I have a question. I was an all-pro quarterback. I won a Super Bowl, and I made the Hall of Fame. God interrupted him and said, so what do you want to know, Aaron, my son? Roger says, well, I guess I want to know why Walter Payton gets a better house than me. God chuckled and said, Aaron, Aaron, that's not Walter's house. It's my house. <laughs> I thought about trying to get Mitch Trubisky in there, but I just couldn't find a way yet. We're in session 12, week 12. We skipped last week, 11. We're going to come back and plug in 11 on January 4th when we come back. But we're in session 12, so find that page in your book. It's called The A-Team. Now, some of you, that makes some of you remember the old TV show with Mr. T. Um, not talking about that, but the, what, the reason I chose that as a title in my way of thinking is, is we're going to talk today about an elite 
an elite group, an elite force of fighting men. And that made me think about A-Team. But we're not going to show a clip from the A-Team. We're going to go to football. I'm going to show you a clip from Remember the Titans, one of my favorite sports movies. Um, it's a story, as you know, of a high school football team that was forced to integrate back in the late 60s, uh, built off kind of a, uh, loosely off a true story. And in the clip you're going to see, it's, it's a short clip, but they've overcome some of these divisions and distrust between black and white and stuff, and they're starting to come together as a team, as an elite sort of fighting force. And I just like this, this scene because it gets me all fired up. So watch the scene. What are you? Move out! Agile! Hostile! What is pain? Fresh bread! What is fatigue? All the clothes! Will you ever quit? No! We want some more! We want some more! We want some more! Turn it! <laughs> Let me ask you something, Mr. Campbell. Uh-huh. What kind of power you got? Oh, man, you know I got some soul power. Oh. What kind of power you got? What kind of question is that? I got soul power. Oh, yes, you do. Right on. Let me ask you something now, Mr. Bertier. Yes. How strong are you? I'm too strong. What? I'm, strong. I'm too oh, strong. I'm strong. Too strong. Oh, right on, I want man. a victory. Oh, I want a victory. I want a victory. It's short, but I love that. If you can hear what they're saying, that originally uh, they're yelling agile, hostile, and mobile. And then he, then he says, uh, Are you, will you ever quit? And they say, we want some more. We want some more. We want some more. I'm never going to quit. And at the end, we want victory. Uh, that, they, they formed a team that eventually became an elite fighting force that won their state championship. With a little bit of review. We've been in the Old Testament for um, weeks now, and for the last three or four weeks, we've been talking about the stories that are related to the life of King David. Uh, we talked about David's unique spiritual friendship with Jonathan. Uh, we talked about David's uh, rather difficult, contentious relationship with the king prior to him, King Saul, who became insanely jealous, and we kind of tracked that a little bit. And today we're going to look at a different uh, uh, little story that comes out of David's life, and it's a story about David and his mighty warriors, or his mighty men, as some translations call it, basically David's A-team. So I'm going to read this. It's a long narrative story again. I'm going to break it apart in several sections, and we'll, we'll make some sense of it. 2 Samuel 23, again, way back in the Old Testament. Uh, these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josh, Josh, I'm going I'm to struggle saying these names, but Josheb, Bashabeth, a Tachmanite. Now, th when that, that phrase tacked on, a Tachmanite, that usually refers to someone's family line. That's an ancestor, so you, you're from the line of this guy, Tachman. Uh, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pasdimim for battle. The Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines until his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi the Herorite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was, there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled before them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. And I'm going to pause there. So this passage, you need to know, comes uh, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament right at the end of David's life. Uh, it's almost um, an add-on to the end of the, of the David story, as if as if he's remembering back across his life uh, meaningful moments and men who were meaningful to him. Uh, the, the period of time where the mighty men were in play actually happened years earlier before David be formally became the king. Remember, he, had, he, he uh, was a young shepherd boy uh, thrust into the spotlight when he arrived at the battlefield. Goliath's out there. Nobody wants to fight him. David goes out as a young man, to make a long story short, takes on Goliath, kills him with a sling, and becomes a hero to his people. 
which begins him on the process to becoming king. He's actually anointed by Samuel, chosen to become the next king, which makes Saul the king actually jealous. So over s several years, David is sort of the king in waiting. And during that time, he's in the wilderness because he's fleeing because Saul's trying to kill him. He's sending soldiers after him because he's jealous. The Philistines are still the enemy because David killed their guy, and they're trying to kill David. So David's in trouble for much of that time, and he's hiding in the wilderness. And some men... 37 in all are mentioned as his mighty fighting force. These guys, warriors, who bonded themselves to David and became his protectors because he was the anointed king, not king yet. But they fought with him, they stood with him, they were with him. So this is the time of his life. And th uh, three of the 37 mighty men are singled out above all the others. And these are the guys we're talking about today. So the first thing, first point in your outline is that David surrounded himself with mighty warriors. Mighty warriors. Uh, this past summer, um, I did a funeral. I do, uh, as you could probably guess, I do, I do lots. I've probably have done over 10 funerals in the last year. Uh, I did a funeral for a man in our church uh, named Clarence Bradley. Some of you have been part of Chapel Street for a long time, know Clarence or knew Clarence. Uh, Clarence uh, died at the age of 99 and a half, exactly. 99 and a half. Uh, he, I knew him uh, he and his wife Mary, because I saw them every week here at church. They were married 77 years at the time of Clarence's death. Uh, Clarence was a smallish man, if you knew him, maybe 5'7", something like that, kind of wiry. And for my entire time here at the church, 32 years now, um, I just knew Clarence as a retired guy. Uh, I knew he'd retired from a job as a machinist at Burgess Norton. He worked there 40-some years, retired, lived in the community. Uh, just a quiet, pleasant uh, elderly man in the church. But when Clarence died, um, I read his obituary. And as often the case with people from that generation, you find out things about them that you did not know. Uh, and I found out, as is the case with many, many men of that generation, he served in World War II. Uh, he uh, was married at age 20, within months enlisted in the army. Uh, his first child was born while he was at war, which was also the case for a lot of guys of that generation. He served in the European theater as a radio operator. He was decorated four times, a bronze star, which meant he distinguished himself by heroic or meritorious uh, service on the battlefield, a two battle stars and a theater ribbon, indicating he participated in two major battles in the European theater. I think one of them was the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, when I was 20, I was just another knucklehead college student, right? When he was 20, he was, he was serving our country as a mighty warrior. And I realized I was doing a funeral not of an old wiry man, but of a hero, a mighty warrior. Uh, well, let's look at these three dudes that are mentioned by name in the scripture. Josheb the Tachmanite. Uh, he's mentioned because he overcame great odds. The Bible says he killed 800 Philistines with a spear at one time. Now, some scholars believe this to be a literal 800. Imagine that. What kind of dude does that? Okay? Some believe numbers in the Old Testament are somewhat symbolic, meaning he killed a boatload of Philistines. Either way, you didn't mess around with this guy. You didn't mess around with Joshua. Second guy, Eleazar, son of Dodai, he stood with David and taunted the enemy, it says. I love that phrase. It's like ancient trash talking. So he stood with uh, David. It says, when the others had fled, when the other Israelites had fled, he taunts the enemy and then fought with great endurance until his hand froze to the sword. I don't know what that means exactly, but maybe he cramped up, couldn't let it go when, even when he was done, okay? Shammah, son of Aegi, took his stand, fought with great courage. Again, when the others had retreated, he's facing the Philistines on his own in a field of lentils. And by the way, small details like that in a field of lentils just makes the story ring true. That, that, that historical detail is interesting. The Bible has all kinds of stuff like that. So, but what I notice is these, the exploits of these three guys kind of read like the back of a baseball card. How many used to collect cards? You know, you, you turn the card over and you, you find the statistics, the guy's career, right? You got home runs, RBIs, batting average, you know, what they call war now, wins above replacement. But these guys, those things are replaced with battles won, Philistines killed with a spear. It's just interesting to me. So David um, had killed the one giant by himself. That's what made David a hero. That's what made him popular and put him on track to become king. But David also knew he needed help. He couldn't do it all by himself. That's significant. He surrounded himself with men who would stand with him, 
that were loyal to him as the anointed king, who would fight with him, who were courageous. And you get the sense that these guys loved David. And you get the sense that he loved them back. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So David surrounded himself with mighty warriors. We're going to come back to that right at the end today. The second thing we see in the story is that David's warriors sacrificed to serve. They sacrificed in order to serve. Um, the Remember the Titans clip reminds me of a football story from my own life, and I've told this a number of times. You guys probably remember it if, you, if I told it at team. I just can't remember where. But I played high school football uh, rather badly on a uh, in a small town north of uh, about 40 miles north of New York City, a small high school. I think in my senior year, we only had 22 guys out for football, barely enough to have a practice. Um, but we had a few really good athletes and started the year ranked in New York State for small schools. But uh, I was the quarterback um, and safety on defense. I played safety and defense because I rarely had to tackle anybody because I really didn't want to tackle anybody. Um, but, and they didn't want me tackling because I could get hurt. I was the only quarterback in the whole program, so if I got hurt, nobody could play quarterback. So I was the quarterback. Um, and, but week by week, I think we started off like two and one, and then our guys started getting hurt. Our best athletes started getting hurt. Running back got hurt, another running back got hurt, lineman got hurt. And so as we get down toward the end of the year, and we started losing games then, and we lost a couple of guys, let's say they, they, the coach had to move me from safety to cornerback, which was a whole different deal. I don't know if you know if you ever played high school football or, football or not, but as safety, I just stood back there, and I was like the last ditch. Nobody passed the ball, rarely in those days, but if somebody really got through, I'd, and I had to tackle somebody, I'd kind of roll on the ground and try to trip them and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> But when you're a cornerback, you have responsibility for, the, for runs, for, especially for sweeps. And in those days, early 70s, the power sweep, uh, that was what people did. They'd pitch it out, two pulling guards, uh, a fullback in front, and then the guy had the ball. Uh, so I went on the side there, and this is what terrified me, because now I knew I had to, if, if I saw that end block down as my key, I had to come up and, and, and try to stop that sweep. And I was terrified. I laid awake at night before the first game playing cornerback because I'm, I got to run. I can't, there's no way to hide. I can't like, I have to go up there. And I was, I was physically afraid to do that because these are big dudes running at you and you had three of them running at you. Your job was to just hit the first guy as hard as you could and try to make a pile. Maybe somebody else tackles the guy. And I really didn't want to do that, but I couldn't admit that. But anyway, so first game I'm playing um, cornerback. Sure enough, like the third play of the game, <laughs> I'm, I'm back there and thought, just don't do a sweep, don't do a sweep, don't do a sweep. And sure enough, block down, here comes the sweep. Two pulling guards, full back, guy's got the ball. So I start coming up to the corner going, oh, Lord, help me. I'm just, what am I going to do? And just before I had to hit the first guy, the captain of our team, Don Scott, one of my best friends, defensive end, um, also the center uh, of our team, so I had a very close relationship with Don. Um, <laughs> he, 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 he shit... <laughs> That's a whole other story, by the way. He, <laughs> he sheds his blocker somehow, and he hits that first guy. He's like 10 feet, 5 feet in front of me. He hits that first guy so hard that his chin strap flies off. It pops off, it flies right by me, like that. And the, I still remember the sound it made when he hit this guy. The guy behind him run, it was, it created a giant train wreck. And a big pile of bodies, including the ball carrier, falls down on top of them. He takes out three guys and the ball carrier. I arrive there. I just fall on top of the pile. <laughs> I might have got credit for that tackle. Don stands up. We clear everything out. He turns around. His eyes are glassy. You know, he probably had a concussion. In those days, we just laughed about stuff like that, right? His eyes are all glassy. I hand him his, I picked up his chin strap, handed it to him, and I said, hey, man, thanks, thanks. He went, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and I sense of, we're Facebook friends, and I sense of emailed him, but that story, he doesn't even remember that play. Because I think his brain was knocked halfway out of his head. But he sacrificed, I always appreciated that sacrifice of courage on my behalf, because I did not want to do that, okay? Look at this story. Verse 13, during harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors, these three guys, came down to David at the cave of Abdullam with a, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At the time, David was in the stronghold, sort of a fort, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water. Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. Now, i got to pause here. This is one of the absolute coolest stories in the entire Old Testament. And it's a completely unnecessary story. 
It doesn't really have to be there, but it's there, and it's a cool story. It reads like a movie script. So David and his warriors, mighty men, are in a battle with the Philistines. Uh, that, that, that's their, 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 um, their enemy to the death. The Philistines were constantly trying to wipe the, the Israelites off the face of the earth. Uh, they're holed up in a bunker somewhere outside Bethlehem, which is the town where David grew up, by the way, which is, by the way, the, why the Christmas story happened in Bethlehem, because the Caesar issued a tax. They had, you had to go to the, your, 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 your ancestral home, which in this case was Bethlehem, because that's where Jesus was from the line of David. So that, the whole story is related there. So he wants water from the well that he grew up with. And he just kind of mentions it out loud. Uh, the warriors overhear him. And in the middle of a, of a war, a battle, they decide to do something for their, for their anointed future king, these warriors. So they sneak out, they break through enemy lines, they draw a bucket full of water from this well, bring it back across enemy lines, risking their lives just so David can have a drink of cool water. It's an awesome story. So why do they do it? Just because. Just because they believed David was God's anointed, because they loved David and they wanted to serve their future king. Now, here's what I think about. I was thinking about even this morning. Sometimes it's hard to see how to make sense of these strange Old Testament stories. Like, why is that there? How does that relate to us living in the 21st century? Well, here's the question. What does it say about, about how and why we serve our king? We celebrate Christmas as Christians because we believe that Jesus was born as the newborn king. We sing that all the time, the newborn king. He's king. That means he's God in the flesh, king of all things, worthy of all our worship and all our devotion. He's the king. He's the source and the hope of our very salvation. He lives in us today by the Holy Spirit who is given us by faith. So how is it that we serve him? How do we serve? The bare minimum? Or do we go beyond, above and beyond, outside our comfort zone? Break through enemy lines, invade enemy territory, take what belongs to him just because he's worth it. How do we serve our king? I'll come back to that in just a little bit. The third thing we see in the story then is David offered ultimate respect. Now, respect is an interesting word. I think as men, we talk about this a lot at team. Uh, we, respect um, is sort of the currency of manhood, I think. Now, respect is important to every human being, but it's particularly important to men. In many ways, I think you could say we live for respect. We long for respect. We crave respect from our wives, sure, from our kids, from our colleagues, from other men. In fact, we know this by how we respond when we feel disrespected. We see it all the time in, in professional sports, right? The multi-million dollar athletes will say, well, it's not about the money, it's about what? Respect. You disrespect me, you're going to have a fight in your hands. Just don't disrespect me, right? Respect. Respect is the currency of manhood, and this story is about uh, respect. The mighty warriors, okay, they, 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 they hear David is thirsty. He's just daydreaming about this water he grew up with, so they decide, hey, let's do something for the king. So they break their enemy lines, they get the bucket of water, they come back, they give it to David, risking their lives, and look at the story. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. We're like, what? That's odd. That seems kind of disrespectful to us. What's he doing? These guys crossed enemy lines just to get in this water, and he pours it out on the ground? What's that all about? But notice, the mighty men were not offended by what David did. Far from it. In fact, we learn later, as we read through the whole story, that they came to love David even more because he poured that water out. Why? Here's why. By refusing to drink that water, David was offering them, in that culture at that time, ultimate respect. 
Notice it, said he pour, it says he poured it out before the Lord. David was so honored by their service and their gift, but he believed that he was unworthy of their sacrifice. He was unworthy of that water purchased at the risk of their blood. And by pouring it out before the Lord, he was saying, only God Almighty is worthy of this kind of sacrifice. So he poured the water out as an offering of worship to the one who was worthy. And in so doing, he honored the mighty men by turning their act of sacrifice and service into an act of his worship. That's what makes this a great story. So what's worship? I use that word, we use that word worship. But my favorite definition, if you've been at, at Chapel Street, you know I talk about this. Worship is offering extravagant devotion to someone or something. Worship is offering extravagant devotion. That which you offer your extravagant devotion to is what you worship. It doesn't have to be God. You can worship your work that way. You can worship money that way. Extravagant devotion. Where do you give your extravagant devotion? Sometimes we think of spiritual worship in terms of the hour we spend at church on weekends here or whatever church you might go to. You know, when you're not busy doing something else, you know that hour, you sing a few songs and maybe listen to other people singing a few songs. Try to stay awake during a 30-minute sermon. That's not worship. That's part of it. That's a good thing to do. Worship is much bigger than that. Extravagant devotion. What these men did when they broke across enemy lines was offer extravagant devotion to their king. Beyond the comfort zone, beyond the, the ordinary, beyond what was expected, beyond the minimum. And what David did was offer his extravagant devotion to his God. Beyond the ordinary, beyond what was expected. So the question is, how do we offer our extravagant devotion to our king? Do we stay in our comfort zone? You know, the hour, the church a couple times a month, or to go beyond. To look for ways to break through enemy lines. We look for ways to get that one, the, the one bucket of water for our king just because he's worthy. How do we serve our king? What does that look like in our lives? I think that's what the story is about for us. Now, none of us are going to swing a sword and kill 800 Philistines, but the question is, wh where is our battlefield? What are we willing to do? Where are we willing to fight? How far are we willing to go? Is our king worth it or not? Here's the questions I want to deal with around the table. I'm going to rewrite these, so kind of listen. I'm gonna, you, you can take these questions almost any way you want to go. But the first question on your booklet is, who do you serve as a mighty warrior? Now, what I really mean there is, who is your king? Where do you offer your extravagant devotion? And how do you serve that which is your king? If one, of these, if one of these mighty men sat down at your table today and said, okay, tell me about yourself, guys. What are you guys, what are you guys about? What would you, what would you say? Where, 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 where do you find the extravagant ocean? Where, where is your service to your king? What's that look like? Just talk about that. And the second question is, who are your mighty warriors? See, David surrounded himself with guys like that. When time comes for you to be in a battle... Do you have three names that you would say, these guys will fight with me? We've talked about this before. Do you have three names? David had three. He had 37, actually, but he had these three. For sure, he knew would fight with him. Do you have those guys? So take those questions however you want. I think you know what we're getting at. Get your donuts, coffee. I'll wrap you up right as we get towards 7 o'clock.